I've learned that disasters or times of crisis are cumulative. So you add one on top of the other, um, kind of like grief. And at some point, you know, it, it just, you can't hold it. And my container can no longer hold everything that's in it. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Louisiana Now podcast. I am your host, Todd Rossnagel. It is great to have everyone along with us. We are pleased to be joined by Bishop Cynthia Fierro Harvey again here on the Louisiana Now podcast. We cover a lot of ground with Bishop Harvey in this podcast episode, from our series of webinars that just began with Project Curate to the coronavirus and the 2020 annual conference. But we begin our time with Bishop Harvey with a series of webinars that we are in the midst of with Project Curate. These webinars have been the focus of the past two episodes of the Louisiana Now podcast, both episodes drawing us in to the topics we've been covering on the webinars. We have two more slated in the series, Thursday, July 23rd and Thursday, July 30th at 2 p.m. These webinars are live on Zoom and feature guests such as Reverend Matt Russell and Dr. Rachel Schneider. We have links to the webinars on the show notes. They do require registration, so please go and check that out. We've been honest from the beginning that a series of webinars will not solve the issue of racial injustice overnight. But we're also encouraged by how many of you are interested, engaged, and willing to share. And for Bishop Harvey, these webinars are incredibly important for all of us. Oh, I, I think that they're extremely important because it gives people an opportunity, even though it's a webinar, to begin to think and maybe dialogue in their own areas. Uh, we often use that term that conversation is the currency of change. Uh, and I think that that's what this does. I've, I've been on both of these so far, and it just prompts a lot of thought. And this is, you know, we, we cannot uh, reverse uh, a, an age-old uh, challenge that we've had uh, with two webinars or two hours. Um, it is going to be a, it's going to be lifelong work uh, in front of us. So I, I'm just grateful and hopeful um, with the participation that we've had, the vulnerability of the questions that people are asking, the honesty uh, that is that is coming out in the in the questions that we're capturing uh, in the Q and A and in the chat. I I just find that really hopeful because I, I get I get and I hear the sense of struggle and and the the grappling that some of our pastors are having and and you know the the, the challenge that this really is um, with people in the pew with people in our communities and so I'm, I'm just uh, I, I always I, I always uh, side on the uh, side on the side of hope and um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful at what I'm seeing and what I am hearing. Uh, I do pray that we can, can put some of this into action. Uh, we can't just listen to this and say, oh, yeah, that was great, boy, this is you know, mind-blowing, and not do anything about it. So I hope that these, these give um, at least some space for people to begin to have conversations in their churches and in their own contexts. You mentioned some of the questions that were lifted up during the Q&A on the webinar. We received an email from a pastor who served a congregation that wanted the pastor to, uh, in, in the pastor's words in the, in the question, uh, to hang a rebel flag on the parsonage. Um, and this was just last year, not 1968. Uh, this was just last year when this happened. Um, as shocking as that is, uh, it, it's a reminder of not only how uh, racism is still here, but the incredibly hard work that uh, pastors in Louisiana are facing when it comes to racism. Um, and while that example is racism, very blatant racism, it's also the shade of unaddressed racism that continues uh, to be a problem. What is your message, Bishop Harvey, to the pastor's who might be feeling overwhelmed with all of this. Right. Um, I do think that some of our racism um, is obvious and um, like the, the situation you just spoke about. Uh, I think some of it's also uh, is nuanced. Uh, 
and 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 I don't want to meet we we grow up in a very in very insular kind of communities right so sometimes it's hard to see that that the the, the wrongness uh, of, of of certain things so because and I'm not trying to defend anything other than sometimes we're, we're just insular we we don't know what that means we don't know how that's heard um oftentimes when when people ask me uh where were your grandparents from you know, people probably ask that question of people all the time but when someone asks me where were your grandparents from I, I immediately think, oh my goodness, you know, are, are you, do you want to know whether my grandparents were legal or they're documented? So I think sometimes people ask what might appear as innocent questions um, and not without the intent of hurting the person, but how it's heard is so, so important. So I think we've got to be very mindful of, of how people hear what we say, how people uh, see what we do, um, and and the harm that we're doing to to people that that we love. And and I, you know, I, I think some of it is nuanced. Um, perhaps some of it is innocent, um, but I think some that some of this is incredibly, incredibly harmful and and is really um, deeply rooted in our systemic racism that we don't even see the difference. So I, I just think that those kinds of questions that these pastors are, are hearing and, experience, and these experiences that they're having, uh, we're having to teach people. Uh, I think that some of us have forgotten our history or the history that, that I learned in school is perhaps not all the history that there is to learn. And in these last few months, um, my husband and I were talking about how much we have learned about our own, our own history, our own American history, and, uh, and the responsibility that, that, my goodness, teachers must have today, uh, an added responsibility to, to teach children um, the real stories uh, rather than the perspectives of, of, that come into our, our education process. So uh, our pastors are having to teach people. Uh, they're having to listen. Um, and as hard, some of it's really hard to hear. I'm, I'm you know, a guilty as charged. Some of it is very, very hard for me to hear. I can't imagine that somebody would actually think that way. Um, but I also have to give space to really listen to people and understand where it is that they're coming from. And, and, and can we have a conversation that is not a defensive conversation, but an opportunity to learn from one another, to see another perspective. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day of, of some millennials and they were history teachers. And, uh, and I'm thinking, I learned a lot in that hour because they, put perspective back in. Uh, and when I was in school, we were not, we didn't really question teachers, right? We just kind of listened, took notes and took a test and hopefully gave them back what they wanted. Um, some of these younger uh, millennial kind of uh, educators are really wanting to engage their students to get the feedback so that in fact, that they can, they can question um, their own history. And I think it's, it's important that pastors do that but I also think that there's some pastoral care that we've got to balance in this as well. Um, and, and I know that's got to be exhausting uh, for pastors that, you know, you, you have to be very aware of every word that you use these days. And that is exhausting, but that's our responsibility as people of faith. Um, as we talked about in one of the webinars that we had, the first one is what makes us unique in this conversation is that uh, while corporations and institutions and schools and everybody's really struggling and grappling with this whole injustice uh, that we're facing on racism, what, what we bring to it is a theological lens, an ecclesiological lens. We see things uniquely through the eyes of Jesus. Uh, I hope there are people at all of those corporations that are doing that too. But we are responsible uh, for bringing that lens or that interpretation to everything that we do. And so this is one of those times that as pastors, 
Um, this is what we were trained to do. We are trained to interpret this through the eyes of Jesus, through our theological understanding, uh, and through our ecclesiological understanding. What does it mean to be the church uh, in these times? You mentioned uh, the exhausting work of pastors, and that brings us to um, the current state of affairs with coronavirus. Uh, it is hard to believe that we are now uh, on the 20th Sunday, give or take, uh, of online or very limited in-person uh, church. And that's 140 days of what has now become, I guess you could say, the new uh, the new normal. What is your message to pastors, to church leaders, and quite frankly, to all of us who just downright miss church? <laughs> oh, I miss church. I miss being with people. I miss singing hymns. So if, if you happen to walk into uh, my house on a Sunday morning, I've got church online. I am belting it out um, by myself uh, because I do, I, I do miss that community. And I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're built for, right, is to be in community with one another. Um, but our pastors have worked hard to even create other ways to build community through you know, there's probably not a morning that goes by where I don't find somebody online doing a morning prayer, a noon prayer at noon, an evening prayer. Uh, we're connecting with people in ways that maybe we even haven't in the past. But that's exhausting. Uh, every day we're learning something new. Every day we're learning something new. And what we learned yesterday may not even apply to today. And so that in itself, and, and it's a lot of sides of your brain. You've got the creative side, you've got the technical side, and that is exhausting. So um, I, I'm, I pray for our pastors these days daily because um, I'm, I'm just um, prayer, prayer, prayer that um, we get us. We're, we're really good at taking care of other people. We're not really good at taking care of ourselves. Um, I've had to look at my own calendar and think, okay, so I'm doing this seven days a week. Where am I? I, I need to set some time aside for vacation. Uh, where am I going to go? So I have to think about vacation very differently right now. Um, and maybe it's more Sabbath than vacation. Um, how do I, how do I use the time to, to, you know, just rest my soul in this because you know, I, every day, those numbers that come out about COVID, then we've got issues with um, uh, the, all the racial injustice. And then we've got the economy and my goodness, are our churches going to be able to make it? I mean, this is like one pandemic on top of another. And, and in my past of working in disaster, um, I've learned that disasters or times of crisis are cumulative. So you add one on top of the other. Um, kind of like grief. And at some point, you know, it, it just, you can't hold it. And my container can no longer hold everything that's in it. So I'm, I'm pray that our pastors will take the time, um, that our, our laity um, will give the pastors the space to take the time. Because I also recognize that our laity are doing the same thing in their own work. They're learning something new every day. They are dealing with families who, um, who are ill. They are dealing with the injustices that all of us are facing. So it, it is no different uh, in, in many ways. So you've got both laity and clergy in this struggle to, to really care for one another. Um, so can we, can, can we extend a little bit of grace? Can we extend some, um, uh, some space for people to just step away for a little bit. Can we encourage one another to do that? I know as a conference, we've got a, an employee assistance program where you can call in and you can talk to someone. We've got other resources that can, can help clergy uh, during this time. I hope that, they, that we will take advantage of some of that and that our laity also uh, and whatever resources they might have uh, within either their work environment or in their in the community. Um, this is, you know, the pastor, again, taking care of themselves and taking care of our own people. Um, sometimes we put others first and it's, it's, it's gonna, it is a wear and tear. I'm, I'm just, um, I pray there's not another crisis and that crisis is our pastors being just over, they're already exhausted but at some point they reach a breaking point. So that my prayer is now is the time to do something about that um, before we get there. 
Let's talk about the public response, uh, Bishop Harvey, to uh, the pandemic. Um, Governor Edwards here in Louisiana has mandated masks in all public buildings and has called for three days of prayer and fasting uh, as Louisiana cases are on the rise yet again. Um, what has been your reaction to how the public is responding uh, to the current state of affairs? You're asking a loaded question. I'm not sure there's a, <laughs> a win on uh, how I answer this question. Um, I think some people are being very faithful. I think there are people who are wearing their mask or using hand sanitizer or washing their hands, um, social distancing. And then I think there are people that think they must be invincible. And, um, and I just, you know, I keep reading stories of healthy 25 year olds um, that uh, have the virus and, and yes, they might get over it uh, a little easier than their grandparent, um, but you still come home, you'll still come in contact with an, an ailing grandparent or an elderly person somewhere. So uh, some, that responsibility is ours. And I saw a mask online today that I wish I'd thought of it. And I think Todd, you thought of it and we could have probably, you maybe solved the national debt if we'd done something about it. But it is a John Wesley image on a mask and it has our first general rule, do no harm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I wish that people would think about that. And I think the governor has done a, a I mean, talk about a no win role that he has right now. Uh, he's done an extraordinary job. I will just say that. I know not everybody agrees with that. Not everybody agrees with him. But can you imagine the, 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 the level of, of, of um, questions that he's got to answer every day and the changes he's got to make. Um, I, I'm just, um, I, my, my heart goes out to him and certainly my prayers. Um, but, you know, he keeps talking about, you know, this is an, an expression of loving our neighbor in its, you know, utmost way. So um, I think there are people who, who are following this. Uh, we've done this before. We did it back in March. Uh, we can do it again, um, but now it, it, we've got to be so, so, so aware of what our actions and how they might impact someone else. I'm, uh, I'm encouraged and also grateful for a praying governor um, that is willing to set aside these three days, uh, I think it's noon, lunch, uh, prayer and fasting. And um, I think that it's, it, it, it I've been praying and fasting for, for since this whole thing started. Uh, so I think his, his um, I, I want to say it's a mandate um, to, to prayer. That is who we are as people of faith is um, we've got to recognize our responsibility. Again, that we uniquely can bring that to this situation is prayer. So I, I hope that everyone will pray and fast. And if it's not at noon every day, it's breakfast. However that works for you, pick something that you can do uh, for a period of time every day for at least those few days and maybe make it a practice for yourself for the rest of this time uh, so that we can in fact be mindful of um, the people who are ill, who are dying, who are in hospitals, the hospital workers, the the, I, I keep saying, you know, doctors and nurses and the person that cleans the room at the hospital or takes out your trash or picks up your trash at home. Uh, these are all people that have put their life on the line for us. And the very least we can do is certainly pray and fast and wear a mask and wash your hands and don't gather in big groups of people. Uh, that is proven, science says that's not a good idea. We're back with more, and our guest, Bishop Cynthia Fierro Harvey, in just a moment, will discuss annual conference next. But first, a word from our sponsor, the United Methodist Foundation of Louisiana. The mission of the United Methodist Foundation of Louisiana is to be a catalyst that strengthens and preserves 
the current ministries of the conference while meeting the needs of a diverse and rapidly changing society. What does that mean for you and me? Well, within the last decade, the foundation loaned over $23 million to more than 100 United Methodist churches. These loans address the needs for expansion, renovation, or unexpected repairs, primarily so churches can be in a better position to meet the needs of the communities they serve. They've been awarding grants for a quarter of a century now, totaling over $5 million, and to think it all started with a $5,000 check back in 1975 at the first meeting. That check, referenced by the foundation as a mustard seed, took root and has now grown to over $145 million in managed assets, the fourth largest of all United Methodist foundations, and it has helped distribute hundreds of thousands of dollars each year to Christian ministries in Louisiana and throughout the world. Want to read more about that mustard seed? You can. It's one of the many stories featured on their website, umf.org. Back to our interview now with Bishop Harvey. Earlier in the show, she was lamenting the inability of large groups to gather together. And that led us to ask, what is the latest on the 2020 annual conference? As it stands right now, we've been asked to hold two dates, Saturday, September 19th, and Saturday, November 21st on our calendars for a potential in-person gathering at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. So what is the latest? Here is Bishop Harvey. Oh, I so wish uh, that's, you know, our family meeting. That's our family reunion. Uh, so I really wish that um, we could gather. Um, my hunch at this moment is that we will not likely be able to gather in person. And so we've got a, a group of us that are beginning to explore what it might mean to do a virtual annual conference. And um, in a way that has the integrity of an annual conference, that has a safety net of an annual conference, um, we can try to do our best to get the work that we need to do, the essentials of annual conference, including worship, including ordination, uh, including honoring those who are retiring or those who have died. And so we're, we're working on that. Uh, we're actually talking to some other annual conferences that have already done this and um, learning what uh, they have learned on these situations so that we don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. But there, there have been many, many great experiences of having uh, online virtual annual conferences. And, and what I commit to the people in Louisiana is that we will have a worshipful experience however we gather. And I, I, I just really was hoping that we could gather in person, but that's just not looking promising, nor would it be responsible at this point. Um, even if we met at Tiger Stadium and sat people, you know, six feet apart in there, I just, I just don't know how we could be responsible. Our annual conference is close to a thousand people. Uh, I don't know how you do that responsibly. So we're exploring these possibilities and you'll be hearing some details soon. We will of course pass along all of those details uh, right here on the Louisiana Now podcast and on our website, of course, la-umc.org. Uh, so we will definitely stand by for that. Um, we ask this a lot of you, but it's a question that many ask, how are you doing? You mentioned earlier that you have a lot on your plate, that you have several uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, how, do, how are you doing? How do you deal with Zoom fatigue, which is definitely a thing. And I know that, that when we're done here, you have back-to-back -back Zooms after this. Uh, how are you doing? I, I will confess, I am tired. I am tired. Um, I'm physically tired. My, my soul is a little bit tired as well. Um, just because again, um, I, none of us have ever led in a pandemic. So everything is new and it's hard to make a decision about anything in the future because you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, so you, you know, being agile, being flexible, being nimble is sort of the operative words uh, for me right now. And that's exhausting. 
uh, that's exhausting work. And so we've got, you know, we've got this pandemic, we've got racial injustice, we've got the economic stuff, and then we still have to put together a budget. Uh, we still, we still have sort of the, the regular things that we do. And so uh, it's not like um, we stopped doing one thing and uh, didn't fill the bucket with something else. So I, I think that our, our buckets are all you know, kind of over full uh, right now. So I, I'll just admit that, that I'm tired. I'm tired. So I'm, I've been looking at how to, how to take some time away uh, from, from the, the Zoom room, uh, as I call it. And uh, it does, I will say, that uh, not having to get on airplanes to go to a meeting uh, or in a car and drive to a meeting or stay in a hotel, uh, that's a real plus about Zoom. Um, and the fact that, you know, I can, I can come in and out uh, pretty quickly. I can put together a meeting really fast. So uh, in working with some of my Bishop colleagues, we, we're not having to schedule a meeting and make sure that you know the planes get there and the hotel rooms are reserved. We can just say, can you meet me at one o'clock uh, for a Zoom? And it's a matter of sending an invitation. So from that standpoint, Zoom has been a gift uh, during this time. Uh, it does, it, it, it is, um, our work is so relational uh, and so interpersonal that I, I do miss the, the nuance of uh, when we're together and uh, of having a meal together, um, of having um, coffee or meeting someone in the hallway and having a conversation or, you know, the, the parking lot conversations that we have before and after meetings. Uh, that's not that's not happening, and so I, I do miss that sort of human interaction. But this is, uh, in many ways, it's been a, a gift uh, financially. My goodness, um, if we're not all traveling in cars and um, spending two hours to get to Baton Rouge for a meeting, um, it really does does um, help uh, incredibly. But uh, I, I I do miss it, and it is it is I think Zoom fatigue. Um, at some point, it must be a diagnosis because I think it, most of us will experience some Zoom fatigue. Bishop Harvey, we uh, we are praying for you, and uh, we are praying for your spirit. We are praying for um, uh, for everything inside the Louisiana Conference and in the days ahead. Uh, we thank you so very much for your time. Thank you for yours. If you would like more information on the webinars we discussed at the top of today's show, please don't forget to go to our show notes or also to our webpage for more information. And one final thing before we say goodbye in this episode, it concerns our website, la-umc.org. Get ready this week for major changes to the website. You'll see a refresh that is years overdue and years in the making. Together with Communications Associate Mary Burley and our partners at Brick River, we've cleaned up the site and we've added a significant number of improvements. There is a chance that some of your navigation has changed, so please make sure to head over to the website and get familiar with the new layout. But we also took a great deal of time to think through how folks navigate the site. If you'd like more information on the website, uh, how it works, and a run-through of the new changes, you can head on over to our YouTube page or to our Facebook page as we have a video that walks you through it. For our producer, Mary Burley, and our sponsor, the United Methodist Foundation of Louisiana, this is Todd Rossnagel. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember, do no harm. Wear those masks.